to all my gamers and NFT players. Viral Hip Hop News and the Lightest Fair Network have teamed up to bring you something revolutionary in the gaming and NFT space. Go to play.finesse.fun right now to play the season preview of the game Finesse Shadow Warriors exclusively on play.finesse.fun. Dot fun. Don't be the last to be a part of this new technological advancement in gaming and NFT. Play dot finesse dot fun to play the season preview of the game finesse. Shadow Warriors link is in the description box. Let them know Viral Hip Hop News sent you. Welcome Let's to another go. episode of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother, old guy from Hip Hop News Uncensored. And sitting across from me is my co host. What up, what up, y'all? It's your man, Sam, and CEO of Viral Hip Hop News. You're in the building for a very special edition of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. Yeah. We got a special guest in the motherfucking building this yes, evening, yes. man. None other than Rich Porter Jr. is on the podcast. What's going on with your family? How you feeling? Uh, I'm great, fellas. I'm great. How y'all doing? Thanks for having me as well. Pleasure's ours, man. It's an honor to have you on. And before we get to the proceedings this evening, special shout out to Nino Boys HT yeah. and Longevity for being the sponsors of this podcast, man. Go grab your tea right here, man. Special shout out to them and my brothers at Nino Boys HT. Salute to y'all, man. So, hey, man, we'll see you a lot, bro. This is one of the first interviews we got to see you in. We got, we're got we definitely happy to have you on this show and definitely on this platform, man. So. How you feeling, bro? Give the people a little introduction to who you are, man. Uh, man, my name is Donnell. Uh, most people know me as man. I'm the son of Rich Porter. Um, reason why you don't see me too much because I really don't do podcasts like that. Um, I'm really a private person. Um, stay to myself, keep my circle small, man. But I'm here and welcoming y'all like y'all welcoming me, and I appreciate y'all for having me. Appreciate you. Definitely appreciate you coming through on the podcast, man. Talk about. We always like to get like a little, you know, um, go start from where you, you know, grew up at and, you know, how you grew up. So take us back to your early childhood, if you can. Um, um, yeah. Well, I grew up in Staten Island, New okay. York, and in Harlem. i um, raised as a single parent. My mom's raised me. Mm -hmm. um, I got two brothers, um, three sisters, two on my father's side, man. I grew up, man. I I had a great childhood, man. Very influential. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? My mom's taught me some great principles and values as a young adult that I was able to hold on to as a man today. Uh, you know, that's about it. I went through my shortcomings and trials and tribulations as a young adult, being a product of poor choices, mm -hmm. which landed me, you know, incarcerated for 12 years. Um, but I'm here today, and I made some positive choices in my life. So I'm here to stay now. Don't know. Obviously, your name is is synonymous for a lot of different things, and I'm saying a lot of people know Rich Porter for the the, the brother and, and who he was, your father, and the movie and all that good stuff. But a lot of people, unfortunately, when these type of people have children, a lot of people just want to hear that story. They don't want to hear or hear the other side or the other objective from where somebody else happened to be sitting. So. Your story is incredible, man. We got an opportunity to sit there and listen to just a very little bit of it, mm -hmm. as well as what we heard behind the scenes, man. So if you don't mind, just get into the situation when, from when the time you were incarcerated, things that you learned while you were in there, and then once you came out, how did things start moving for you? Oh, man, that's a deep story. So just to give it to you briefly, a brief synopsis, right? I learned being a pro um, being incarcerated that I was a product of poor choices, right? Mm -hmm. I was a carbon copy of what I saw, what I've experienced, and what my environment taught me, um, which I see in most societies that we become carbon copies. We dress alike, we look alike, we act alike, we respond alike. You know, the average young adult coming from an impoverished environment, they're in jail by 16, 17, 18. They very rarely graduate. You know what I'm saying? I was just one of those kids that was influenced by what i seen before me. Mm -hmm. And I made those poor choices, but... The difference is when I went to jail, I was able to see myself and separate myself from the rest of the individuals that I was a part of. And that was like my greatest lesson learned, you know? Um, so making that transition and coming home, I just never looked back, you know? I never wanted to be on no corner. I never wanted to be in no environment that I felt wasn't serving me. I realized that we making choices based on our limited mindset, based on our thought process, based on what we see. So once we step outside of what we see and open ourselves up to a broader world, those choices aren't there anymore. Now there's other opportunities for you. So I choose the other opportunities. I came home, went and got my bachelor's degree, and okay. went and got a job because guess what, man? I make more money working a nine to five than I was hustling. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and I made a great deal of money hustling, but 
working a nine to five, I didn't have to look over my shoulder. Yeah, I had to pay taxes. Yeah, you know, I had to be, you know, um, frugal with my cash and be mindful of it. But that's the world of being an adult. You know what I'm saying? Paying taxes, being frugal with your money, knowing what to spend your money on. And um, and I'm here today to tell about it, man. Most people that come home from jail, most people that I've been incarcerated with aren't doing, not to say I'm doing the greatest aspect of my life, but you know what I'm saying? The recidivism rate is high. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because some people always want to be, most people just want to be accepted. Right. They want the fast cars. They want the clothes. They want the women. They want the alcohol. They want the substance abuse. They don't want the responsibility of paying bills. They right. don't want the responsibility of going home every night, getting up in the morning and doing the same shit every day. That's tired. It's boring. Mm-hmm. But that brings longevity. Right. So I learned that. And that's who I am. Right now, when you was incarcerated, like before you got out, did you start visualizing your life, what you was going to do when you got out? Because a lot of guys say they already had like stuff mapped out. So when they hit the streets running, it was a little easier for them instead of going back, you know, keeping the same habits they had when they was in prison. You know what it was? <clears throat> Incarcerated is a thousand war stories people tell you. Right. Everybody's the man. Everybody got this glamorous story of who yeah. they was prior to being in here. Yeah. But then you come home and you see them and you like, what happened to who you used to be? Yeah. You know, I caught a life charge at 16 mm. Dang. Right? for drugs. And um, so I used to look out the window like, you know, when given the opportunity, I ain't, I ain't, you know, I'm not coming back. Given the opportunity, I want to put my feet in some sand. Like, I, I, I never went to the beach prior to going to jail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Word. So to hear people say that they was, you know, people older than me say they was on vacation and stuff like that. I was like, well, I've never been on vacation. Like, I met a dude who told me he had a boat in the Honda Accord in his own house. I was, I was intrigued by it. Like, you got a boat? Like, okay, cool. Like, <laughs> all right. You know, that's the life I want to live. I, uh-huh. I don't care about the fly flashiness that most people get caught up in. I want it to be like. I want to live my life. Like, I want to enjoy life. Too many people aren't making it because they want to live somebody else's life. Yeah. I didn't want to live nobody else's life. I wanted to live a life I can enjoy. I came home. I traveled the world. I got two young boys. I take care of my kids. I'm very family orientated. I love my friends because there's very few of us. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I love them. I reach out to everybody who I care about, and I do that on a consistent basis. And I'm happy. You say you got incarcerated at 16, got a life sentence at 16 years old for drug drug yeah. charge. We sat in AR Abs um, mm-hmm. trial a couple years back. We got a chance to sit there firsthand and watch everything that was going on. And the defense absolutely dissected the prosecution. They didn't have anything on them yet. Here we are and here we stand. AR Abs is sitting there probably for the rest of his life behind bars over a nonviolent charge. Mm-hmm. Talk about the your thoughts on the legal system. And at the time when you were going through what you were going through, just how unjust it may have felt or how your case was even presented. Did you feel like they had anything on you to put you or even charge you with life? How, how did, what was that experience like? So, going you know, that? back then it was the, you know, the drug laws that if you get caught with a certain amount of drugs, it's automatic life yeah. sentence. Yeah. So, um, um, with that being said, the legal system is a, is a messed up system. They, their guidelines were, you know, unconstitutional. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm not complaining about the system because like my mother taught me, you put yourself in that situation. So that system is, I don't, at, at this present moment as a man, I don't care about the legal system yeah. because I'm not putting myself in a, in a situation where that legal system is a pro, is an issue for me. You know right. what I'm saying? That's not a problem for me no more. But back then it was a problem because I put myself there. Yeah. I was out there doing wrong. I was out there selling drugs. I was out there being a product of my environment and being a product of your environment, like anybody going to tell you, like I would tell my kids, going to jail, getting robbed, and dying are some of the outcomes that you have to look forward to. And when you met with those outcomes, you got to own that. I owned it. I did my time, and I ain't never got to look back. Take us back to at what age did you find out that your dad was actually Rich Porter? Obviously knowing who he was, but knowing who he really was. And what was your emotions like at that age, finding out who he really was, what he meant to people. I had uncles that was um would always keep me abreast of who he was. Okay. But my mother is a strong black woman, so she shielded me from that stuff. Like, gotcha. you know, money and material things didn't matter to her. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So right. nothing about what he was doing mattered to her in the sense that it mattered to me. 
You know what I'm saying? It might matter to the people around everyone else, but my mom's taught me better than that. Mm-hmm. And she raised me better than that to not need or rely or depend on situations of that magnitude. So, you know, I was young and hearing about it and, you know, I wasn't even in awe of it until I started to come in the streets at like 11, 12. Then it was like, oh, okay, wow. You know what I'm saying? But by yeah. then, my father was already dead. You yeah. know what I'm saying? He had passed away already. So, I, but I was, then I was in awe of it. But then as I started to hustle and move around myself, it was like, okay, I see what people, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what intrigues people about this lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Back then, money was easy. You make $10,000 a day just coming outside. Now you make $1,000 a day. Mm-hmm. So there was a difference back then. Absolutely. So you say you did 12 years? Yeah. 12. So, I mean, you go, every decade, shit changes up. I mean, you look at the phone and how it's evolved in the last 10 years and mm-hmm. how social media styles, how that evolved. So going in and coming out, how, how did the world around you change? The barbershop was the new block. <laughs> yeah. I, never, I didn't know how to use a cell phone, credit card, debit card, an ATM machine. Mm. Um, things changed drastically. Uh, um, but you know what changed the most to me? Morals and principles got watered down, you know? Mm. Um, I grew up and, you mm. know, the individuals that I hung with, we was a tight-knitted, indiv- you know what I'm saying? Tight-knitted group. Yeah. We cared for one another. We supported one another. We loved one another. You know what I'm saying? Your yeah. brother's going to fight for you. Like, when I was in trouble, they was coming to school for me. Like, yo, what's up? Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. If I had some beef, they was coming up. Yo, what's up? Who? Who? Mm-hmm. Where you at? Now you can't call somebody to save your life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's what I came home to. Yeah. So things changed drastically. I think the morals and the principles of life has been watered down. And I think that is because, once again, we want to be carbon copies of what we see, not understanding the magnitude of what it takes to be that person. Moving forward a little bit, um, let's talk a little bit about hip hop. What's your perspective of you know, hip hop? Because even when you went in and it came out, hip hop was different. You know, I didn't take music seriously. This is entertainment. Right. Back then, you know, bust around, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was entertainment. You loved that. You know what I'm saying? You hear Ja Rule song on the radio or something like mm-hmm. that. You hear DMX song. You hear Locks, Nas, A Z. You know, this is entertainment. You know, Cameron. These are like mm-hmm. these are entertainers to me. Like you love their music. I never really gave light to their lifestyle. I, I enjoyed their music. Nowadays, I feel like people are making music to be synonymous with their lifestyle. And right. Like you're an entertainer, like entertain us. I want to hear some good quality music. Right. Make me feel good. Make me vibe out when that beat come on. When you heard Pasta Cavassier, it was mm-hmm. Busta Rhymes, right? Yeah, Busta Rhymes. That Diddy. beat was just like <laughs> that had you just like bobbing your head. You know, it's entertainment. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? I don't care about the gangsterism or the, you know, you didn't hear that in music back then unless it came from like the West Coast. Right. You know what I'm saying. I want to ask you, speaking on that, we see now in. Athletics, football, basketball, whatever the case may be, wherever the culture is, music, their athletics, it seems like there's a kind of like a bleeding within the street culture and these mainstream type of ways of entertainment that we find ourselves finding success in. And it doesn't seem like a lot of the people involved know how to separate the two. I think we were talking to Maj yesterday and he said, he, saw, he quoted Will Smith when he said, Will Smith said, there's a difference between a rapper and a gangster. You can't do certain things as a rapper as you can do as a gangster and vice versa. Why do you think, in your opinion, all of it's kind of meshed and you see uh, basketball players wanting to be in the street life, rappers wanting to be in the street life, but then when they get caught with real street life situations, they want to revert back to being that civilian, that person that they wanted to. They they love the persona, but when it becomes real for them, they want to kind of ditch it and get away from it. How do you feel about that? Most people glorify the street life. Why? It comes with money, yeah. fast cars, irresponsibility women, yeah. and the I don't give a fuck lifestyle. Um, so entertainers adapt in the street life personas because they think that that's gangster. They think that that's cool. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But then you got people that's really gangsters in these streets who want to be doing the cool stuff you entertainers is doing. Word. You know what I'm saying? Right. So a person like me who's been through my trials and tribulations, you think that I want to live a life of somebody that's of the life that I live. No, I want to be living a cool life. Mm-hmm. I want to, you know what I'm saying? Be able to drive a nice fancy car and go to my house in the hills and not hear gunshots and ambulance and police. Like, I don't want to have to 
carry a gun. That's what you pay security for. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to have to hurt somebody. This is where you move out of your environment so that you're not a product of having to hurt someone or be hurt. Um, so I just think that people glorify the street life like it actually is the end all or be all. No, people in the streets trying to get out the streets. Mm -hmm. It's people that have never been in the streets that want to get in the streets because they don't actually know what it entails to be here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They don't know what it entails to be in the streets. Right. So this is where it kind of, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it's merging. Right. Why? Um, like I said, you know, I'm sure this dates back to 20, 30 years ago when, you know, rappers and singers and entertainers wanted to hang around the drug dealers, probably like Nicky Bonds or, you know what I'm saying, the Rich Porters of the world mm -hmm. and all these people. Like, they thought that their life was more intriguing than their own, yeah. not knowing what these individuals had to go through to be who they are. You know mm -hmm. So, you know, and then when they actually have to deal with the responsibility of owning up to your shortcomings, it's like, but that, that's not me. So mm -hmm. why betray a lifestyle that's not you then? Right. Be who you are. I know earlier we was talking off the uh, camera, we was talking about uh, your uncle and how his life kind of gets overshadowed by your father's death. Can you talk a little bit about that if you can? Yeah, we had mentioned that off camera. As I yeah. mentioned, um, my aunt is raising awareness right now mm -hmm. to put a plaque up on a block of 132nd Street and Lennox and 7th in name of my uncle. And um, also there's a plaque going up in the school that we're trying to raise awareness of. And it's unfortunate that his life was lost due to my father's lifestyle and actions, but nobody seemed to take notice of that. Mm -hmm. Nobody seemed to care that this is a child. Like he was a kid. Right? Mm -hmm. His life should have mattered more than my father's life. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, like, you know, you spotlighting my father's life, but his little brother passed away mm -hmm. based on the lifestyle he would live. Like, anybody in the street life know that we, our main goal is to get money and protect our family. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I'm sure my father would be turning in his grave. And I'm sure he is, knowing that his brother was murdered based on his actions. You know, your, your your father obviously he has this this persona about his name. We got the movie and all of that, but to him that was your father. You know what I'm saying? We have a lot of young men out here, especially young black men, who don't get the opportunity to have a father or be able to have that nourishment. And especially as men, most of us as fathers in here, we know how that feels from the other side as being a dad and how important that is to take mm -hmm. care of our family. How did you feel? Like like. What was your feelings like about your dad and outside of the glitz and the glamour of what everybody else thought? You hearing all these different stories, but personally to you, how was that? I didn't really have no feelings because I never really had a rapport and relationship like that in that magnitude. But I'm a man now. Yeah. I am a father. I got a 21-year-old and a 9-year-old going on 9-year-old. And um, I protect my kids at all costs. Yes, sir. I love all my kids. I speak to my kids. I empower my kids. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. That's my job and my duty. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like most men out here, whether you're from the streets or you're not from the streets, we need to be in our kids' life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because kids are more caught than taught. As single parents out there, the single moms out there, I give kudos to y'all. It's hard raising young boys and young women. There's a balance. A, a positive adult male figure is needed mm -hmm. to transition your kid from certain ages in their life so that they don't make the same shortcomings and be a victim of going to jail, getting robbed, robbing somebody, or doing something foolish. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's my job to be a dad. That's my number one job in this world, above all else. Facts. And I think all young men who have children need to be active in their kids' life, no matter what. Did your mom ever tell you that, you know, you kind of remind certain things you do remind you of your dad, I'm sure? Yeah, I'm sure she says <laughs> it, but my right. mom's just a strong black woman, man. Right. I don't know if she knew what she was doing or not, but she did a hell of a great job in raising me and my brothers. Mm -hmm. And we all share the same principles of morals and values and respect and integrity. And that's I'm what sorry. she taught me above else. It didn't really have nothing to do with my father. Okay. Like, you know, she he wasn't an active figure in her life, so mm -hmm. she didn't she could have cared less, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, in hindsight, I just looked at how she raised me and what she instilled in me. And what she, and, and you know and how I became throughout my own shortcomings, and you know she did the best she can she yeah. could have done. Right. Sure. And you know I feel like I came out fine despite what I went through. 
when you were going through what you were going through, what were the conversations like? How was the relationship with your mom at that time when you kind of got out in the street and started growing up and doing some of those things? Listen, I got hit at the parole board four times. Mm. And every time my mom's, I spoke to my mom's and, and gave her that bad news. Yeah. Her only response was, you be all right. I'm going to come see you on Friday. We right here. I ain't going nowhere. Mm. You need something? I'll be up there on Saturday. And I'd be like, all right, cool. No problem. And guess what? Each and every time I hung up that phone call with her, that's all I needed. Yeah. Like, I would walk away and they'd be like, yo, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. My mother just reassured me that I was good. Mm. And that's all I needed to get by. Yeah. Talk to us about some of your business ventures. I know you got the t-shirt line. Yeah, we got things. a t-shirt line coming out. She the crack valve. Yeah. Rich Porter. <laughs> Saying? Yeah. Um, It's a t-shirt line we got dropping ASAP. So okay. when you get a chance, go into infoironrich.com. Check the link in the bio and you will be able to grab one. We also working on the um, sneaker deal. I can't really speak much on it until we... You know what I'm saying? Clear the tape on it, but we're right. working on a sneaker deal in my father's name. Um, one of his favorite brands of sneakers he liked to wear. So okay. we're working on that right now. Um, we got a lot of things in the work, man. Just keep checking the link in the bio. It's going to steer you to the pages that you need to go to grab all the information that we got going on. You know, one thing that I love but drives me crazy at the same time, you see brothers get out and they get right to the floor. Most of them get to the floor running. They start their own businesses. They start their own ventures. They become an entrepreneurs. A lot of them, because they can't even get into the workforce because of their situation, they want to get out here and really still got to earn a living the right way. So they become entrepreneurs and business owners and things like that, like you're doing so right now. Then you got brothers on the street that just take advantage of that shit and don't do anything. And we sitting out here and we think everybody, everything is owed to us. And we think everything's supposed to come our way. And we're not going to get a job because of this or do that. But we don't have any type of drive or, or any type of motivation to get out here and, and do for self. What was the motivating factor for you to get out and do for self? Like, when was it like, you know what, no, I got to start these businesses. I got to get shit rolling. Was it immediately when you got out or did it take some time? Um, No, immediately I was, you know, just trying to get my life together. Like I said, I went to school. I worked. I bust my ass. I raised my kids. It was immediately. But um, just to give you some, my own perspective and opinion on what you just said, right? Yes, sir. I realized we glorify the street life like it's ideal. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the average street individual, as talented as he, as much talented as they might have, or as talented that they are, most people are suffering from a low self esteem. Mm-hmm. They mask it with drugs, materialistic things, and women. Mm-hmm. But their self esteem is low because if you was that talented and you was making that much money, why aren't you a CEO? Why aren't you your own boss? Why, why aren't you taking the time to put, invest in yourself? Mm-hmm. You know, most people don't feel like they qualify. Most people don't feel like they fit in the in the average world. Right. And you do. The average world is calling on you. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, I've never went into a job environment or a business environment and wasn't liked. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Whether my drive, my hard work, my charisma, my character, my effort was loved in any environment I went in. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that can be the same for any street individual, but they self-esteem and allow them to get to that level because they don't feel worthy enough. Right. Yeah. That's just my personal opinion. Now, you said you got your bachelor's degree. How yeah. was that whole process going through that, getting out of prison then? Oh, that was easy. Yeah? Yeah, okay. I tell everybody, go to college if you get the opportunity, man. Right. You know, people say college ain't, ain't worth much and nowadays you could be your own boss and your own CEO and don't, you don't need college for it, right? But colleges give you an opportunity to network with other people. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You meet other people, you network with other people. And um, I was getting straight A's in college, but college was like interpreting the streets to me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Dealing with every ethnicity and background and being knowledgeable on what's going on in your surroundings. So schoolwork was easy to me. I just had to apply myself. We like to talk about the culture here on this platform and how it pertains to us. I want to ask you, what's your overall thoughts on black people in general as it stands in 2023 obviously we see what's going on in the media we see how the political lines are played we see how everything is going on with our culture and we've seen how it's evolved from 70s 80s 90s 2000s and now what's your thought on the on the culture how how was it when you were incarcerated how were the brothers speaking about us when we were in there and then once you got out how how what's your overall thoughts on the culture as it stands when you're incarcerated the culture is different yeah the culture is interdependence. I need you like you need me. 
So, you know, there's cliques and gangs and, you know, different sectors in prison. But the culture is we need each other. So we're going to support each other. We're going to rely on each other. We're going to depend on each other. If I can't depend on you, then I can't deal with you. Right. And society, as an African-American male in this culture, it seems like everybody's out for self. Yeah. You don't have too many people like dream, like dream from the Nino boys or yes, like sir. myself or like my man B.O. or like my homeboy Olu. Like You don't have too many people who are interdependent, who understand that we need each other as a human being just to grow. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's so many selfish-minded people in here, for sure, in this world, and it's like only in our culture because other cultures you don't see that. Other right. cultures they're interdependent; they yeah. rely, depend on one another. You can count on your counterpart. You can count on you can almost count on your enemy in another culture. For sure, and this culture is sad. You can't even count on your friends. Mm. You can't mm. depend on your friends. You can't even depend on your family. You can't depend on your father or your mother, like your brother or your sister. It's like everybody even want something in exchange for their loyalty, for their time, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or for their love. And if you're not giving it, then they're not there for you. What's Thank next you. for you, man? If you got you know anything you want to share with the people? Yeah, what's over. next? Like I said, man, we got crack valves coming out. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But we got them green tiles dope, coming out. Um, <laughs> check the link in the bio. Check the link in the bio. It's coming out. Um, by the time this interview drop, you'll be able to go to Info I Am Rich and check the link in the bio, and you'll be able to find them. Um, we also got the sneaker deal coming out. Um, we also working on the sneaker deal. By the time this video comes out, we might have something nasty for you as well. Um, we're just, I'm just working, man. Um, we pushing everything rich right now. We gotta, we trying to work on this um, Rich Porter Museum where you can come and get a concept of who Rich Porter was, mm-hmm. his lifestyle, where he hung out at, what he did, how he dressed, um, all memorabilia, Rich Porter, dope. Um, take some dope pictures. And um, we got some surprises that we're trying to, we up in the works are trying to put together as well. So we in motion right now, and we welcome everybody to come be a part of this life experience. Um, my father, you know, as we look back in hindsight, he is one of the most influential hustlers of our time. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he didn't realize the impact who he genuinely was and how it has had on people's lives 30 years later. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, we were introduced to your dad from a movie, Paid in Full. Shout out to Makai Pfeiffer, Wood, Harris, Cameron. Did a phenomenal job yeah. from our art viewpoint yeah. of, of telling that story. How do you feel about the story? I know we were talking behind the scenes a little bit about when you saw the movie and how you felt about the movie, but if you don't mind just sharing a little bit of what you thought about the movie and how the movie itself has affected you in your personal life. Um, well, it really hasn't affected me in my personal life. It was a dope movie. It's a, you know, um, legendary movie. Um, um, but it just showed a snippet of his lifestyle. Man, okay. we need to create a better version that can give my father's lifestyle from who he was as a young child to who he became because his trials and tribulations made him into the individual he was. And we need to show light on that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What he went through to be the person he went through because as people were saying, anybody would mention that, you know, he walked with love. He walked with grace. He walked with, you know what I'm saying? And he had integrity and principle. But where did that integrity and principle come from? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He had a great mother. He had a father in his life. He had a sister in his life. You know what I'm saying? But where did his principles and values come from? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that story need to be told. My father's story need to be told from the beginning of his life to the end of his life. And hopefully one day we can make that happen and show the world who he was and why he became the man he was. Because most people just see the glitz and glamour, the cars, the lifestyle, him never wearing the same outfit twice. Yeah, that's all fine and dandy, but that came from somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Right. So the, the original movie, your family didn't have no... Like Dylan's in that movie, they didn't go to your family at all. Yeah, you know, yeah. they did. Okay, yeah, okay, they did. They okay. had um, they had went to my family and I guess got their blessings. I was incarcerated at the time, okay. so yeah. I wasn't there for that. But yeah, they did get the family's blessings. But like I said, that movie wasn't you know solely about my dad. Not you. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, if you have a story that somebody may have sh- shared with you about your father that somebody may not know or we don't know throughout, um, what, from not our vantage point of, of paid in full, do you mind sharing one of those stories that we may not know? Um, man, I 
got plenty of stories, um, but just one in particular that my aunt told me recently, um, and I didn't notice that. Um, she was like, my father used to be a skateboarder when he was a kid. The fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was, I, I was, that's what I was like. Well, she was like, yeah, he broke his arm or something like that, skateboarding and stuff. He used to be skating down 145th Street, the hill. Damn. And I was like, what? She was like, yeah, he used to be skateboarding. I was like, I thought that was dope because that's not something that most people actually know about him. You right. know what I'm saying? Um, so I was like, you know, I was like, damn, that's dope, man. So when the opportunity come to actually tell his story in full in his whole life, based on his life and, and my uncle's life, yeah, I think that story should be told. Give um, him a little more of a human side. Yeah, He's not a just human, a human not... side, but yeah, you know, it's other stories like, you know, another story she told me about one day, um, my grandmother left him in the house and she had went out and left him with like a can of Spam. <laughs> like eat some Spam. And when she left, they was like, man, we ain't eating this. So they threw the spam out the window to feed like the dogs and the cats in the alley. In, and they went to the supermarket and stole a steak and came <laughs> back and cooked the steak. I was like, oh, word? And I was like, yeah. You know, I thought that was, you know, super funny. But, you know, those are humble beginnings that right. most people don't know about. Right. So I thought that was super nice, cool, dope story about him as well. That, you know, like I said, I would love for one day his full life story to be told in full. Did you hear about um, Paid in Full too? They said Dang Dad's supposed to be working on that. You hear anything about that? Um, yeah, I've heard about it, but okay. I didn't. I didn't hear much of it like that. Okay. Um, I think I don't have nothing to do with my father. I think they're just using a Paid in Full n- namesake to transition to somebody else's story. Got you. Okay. If if there were to ever be a movie or a documentary or some type of film based around your father, let's say it was a, a non-fictional story, let's say an actor was playing it, would you yeah. ever want to play the role of your father? And if not, who would you want to play the role of your father? Um. Well, you know, I ain't no actor, man. I have to, t- <laughs> I have to take some acting lessons, you know. Um. But um, I, you know, I will play it if need be. But um, I I never really thought about who would be fitting to play it. Makai Fife, I think, played a great... Did his thing. Hell yeah, yeah, I think yeah. he played a great... You know, I think he's an incredible actor, first of all. Yeah. But I think he played a great role. Um, So, yeah. I never really thought about that as a, you know, as a whole, who I would want to play his character. I think Makai Fife did a good job if they can get him to play it. Mm-hmm. Play it. I think it'd be dope. If not, if y'all need me to step in and get my <laughs> acting career, I'll just let me take some acting classes. Or so. Any plans for like uh, another movie, like from your father's perspective, more so? Yeah, man, I'm in the works to try to see if we can get that to be created as well. Right. I'm not sure. You know, right now ain't nothing ice in stone. Oh gosh. But like I said, we in motion right now, so we making everything rich right now. Cool. We definitely appreciate your time yeah. reporting hip hop and sense of podcast. I got one more question for you. Forget up out of here, brother. Um, a learning lesson for anybody, any young brother who's out in the street, they hustling, they doing their thing. They got one foot out of jail. They got one foot in the street. Obviously, they're going through a lot, man. If any advice that you can give them, please do so now. Um, the advice that I would give is to invest in yourself. You know, don't, you know, we have to stay away from investing in materialistic things, investing in these streets. Invest in yourself, man. Find your talent. Find what you're good at and invest in yourself. And it'll take you a long way. You know, the hardest thing for us to do as young black men is to look within ourselves and see that jewel and diamond that lingers within us. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. But we all have it. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. we got to dig a little deeper to find it, though, for some of us. And once you find it, you won't feel as you feel. You won't respond as you respond. And you won't move as you move by being a product of poor choices right. in a poor environment. You'll be a product of your own choices no matter what the environment you place yourself in. So that's all I would do. Invest in yourself. Find your niche. Find that diamond within you and... And turn up like you turn up by anything else. For sure, man. Rich Porter Jr. on the Hip Hop Uncensored Appreciate podcast. It. One more time, give your uh your t shirt line and any other links you want yeah, to get. Yeah, Rich people. Porter, yeah. info I am Rich. Check out the link in your bio. Come get your capsule ASAP. Indeed, indeed. Sam and Viral Hip Hop News. Oh, got Hip Hop News Uncensored. Yeah. Salute. Go to manlycure.com right now to get you a tea. Health benefits help reduce stress, kills cancer cells, and removes toxins, help weight loss, supports liver health, good for skin, helps with respiratory and anti-inflammatory. Proudly black owned. Go support right now. And I would not be remiss if I didn't give a big shout out to our brother Nino Boys yeah. for setting up the motherfucking yes, interview, yes. for being a plug to this incredible interview. We Definitely. can't wait to do it again, man. Once again, shout out to Nino Boys. Shout out to Rich Porter. Bro. Salute for you. Appreciate opening it. your doors man for us man we definitely appreciate it and everybody involved 
Lonnie Fresh Films, our brother Mock behind the ones and twos, man. My cuz, appreciate y'all. Till next time, man, we out of here, bro. Salute. Thank you for having me. Appreciate Thanks. it.